good afternoon. Uh, again, you are all welcome to the second presentation uh, of our online seminar series uh, within the scope of uh, summer school program. Uh, I would like to thank to all of you for your participation. Uh, today, Maria Jose Duran Vaquero and Jose Antonio Gonzalez Casares from ESADA uh, will make their presentation. The title is Research Foundations and Strategies for Intervention in Heritage Architecture, Relevant International Examples. Uh, Maria Jose, the word is yours. Well, everyone, I'm sorry, I'm going to be the, the first one talking because as I said to Sergio, I am a member of a panel today and I will have to leave a little bit sooner than expected. So if you don't mind, I will be the, the one presenting in the first place. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. So. Well, first of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am really, really very happy to be to be here with you today, although it has to be virtually, of course. And uh, this work that we're going to do together with the students, it has a double purpose. So it's mainly going to be a design and meditation work. You will have to analyze an area uh, and you will have to do a proposal. But on the other hand, it's also an academic work. And as such, you will have to comply with a minimum scientific and document re requirements. So, well, this is just a, um, a brief presentation. I finished my doctoral thesis a couple of years ago in 2021. I submitted in November. And I had to, as part of the, um, of the work of being a doctorate, you have to do many different um, uh, papers in different journals. So with the things that I learned doing my uh, thesis and all these papers along the, 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 the time, I'm going to give you some hints on how to make your document a little bit more uh, academic, and a little bit more precise. The first thing is where to look for quality research. That's the first question we need to ask. There are some uh, databases that are very specific, very well known, like the journal citation reports or a scopus, but um, you have to pay to have access. Probably in your university, maybe at Jassar or West Attica, through the library, you can have access to them. But for example, unfortunately, here in Esada, we don't have access yet to that uh, database, but it doesn't matter. We have Google Scholar or in Spanish is Google uh, Academic. So I'm going to uh, tell you some things on how to use it and what are the results that you can expect uh, from it. Um, the research uh, process that you're going to do, it's going to be online in the first um, part. And we have different things. And what I'm going to, to tell you in a very practical way is what would I do if I were one uh, part of a team? So I'm going, I was thinking on how to prepare this presentation. And I thought if I were a student, I would like someone to tell me what to do in the first place, where to start. So I took the, the position of a student and I thought, well, what would be the first steps uh, regarding the, the research. So I'm going to take, I'm going to imagine that I am part of the member of bathing culture in the Mediterranean basin, okay? I'm going to be part of that group and I'm going to tell you what would I do. So the first thing I would go to Google Academic, probably most of you have used it before and probably you know, I don't know, that uh, once you put the, the, the prompt, once you write what you want to, to know, you will get the results. And it's very important to see the number uh, that you have uh, that says cited by, and you will find a number, cited by 15. That means that another 15 academic works has used this job or this uh, work 
as a reference. What is the best number to be cited by? There is no specific number, but I would say that above five, another five universities or another five researchers or students, they have used your job or that job as a reference. I would say that's a good number. And if we use 15, uh, that would be a very good number. There are some very, very popular uh, research that has 1,000, 2,000 cited by. Well, but this is in a next level thing. Uh, we don't have to worry about that high number. Above five, that would be good enough. But be careful, because if we write just bathing culture in the Mediterranean basin, we're going to get results related to water, to society, to culture, but probably we are not going to get any results about um, architectural baths. So you have to change the words. I did a first um, input with bath architecture in the, in the Mediterranean. And one of the results is this job that you can see on the right side. It's uh, a work from Cambridge. So if it comes from Cambridge with 15 cited by, we can be sure that this work is going to be good enough to use it as a reference in our research, okay? I have done some research about um, uh, baths in the Mediterranean basis, and I think these uh, seven, I think we have seven uh, references would be enough would be a good start. So for that group, I don't remember the names of the people in that group. Well, you have this help. You might use them or you might use some others, but you need to have some, referen some references about general information about baths. Here you have two and they talk about Roman baths, um, preliminary evaluation of bath architecture, uh, the, the second one is architecture of uh, Islamic public baths. So that's quite generic, but in general in the Mediterranean area. But after that, you have to look for more specific information about baths or the archeological area where you are going to work. So here you have some examples of the archeological sites in in the Middle East, in Seljuk. I don't know if it's pronounced Seljuk and the Izmir area. So he, there you have, we have a very uh, interesting document um, from the UNESCO World Heritage uh, in 2016 about Ephesus, which is the historical area where you're going to work. And um, the last results that I'm going to show you, they are case studies. So we are talking about some references as general information, and we need to read them, analyze and extract what we want from this uh, work. We have some specific information about the area we're going to work, and now we have some case studies. These case studies, and they are for, and the, the author is Sergio Osum, and everything that you are the author in the second one. And they are very good case studies about things similar. They are not related to baths, but they have the structure that you should follow. It's an academic structure about a design work. So we have one is a proposal for adaptive reuse in a lighthouse. And the second one is uh, working in an old olive factory. I asked permission to Sergio, if I could use some of the images, because in the case study, a proposal for adaptive reuse uh, of Sarpinsic Lighthouse, look at the index. They give us an abstract, which is the thing that you have to do um, the last. And they, they talk about analogical approach in adaptive reuse. So they talk about the general thing, adaptive reuse. Then they go to lighthouses as a typology. Then they go, they go a step further talking about that specific lighthouse values. 
So they go from the general, they come down to the very specific. And then after studying from general to specific, then I make my proposal. I give you, as, as a writer of a paper, I give you information of the general, and then I go down to the very specific. And the last thing is to give you my proposal, what I want to do with it. You can see the, some of the general pictures of the area above, and um, the last two images, they are part of the proposal. It can be drawings, it can be a plan, it can be a 3D, that's up to you. But after making your proposal, you have to write a conclusion. So a, a personal appraisal, what do you think about your job? What could you do in the future? Should you show this work to the policymakers to do something? And in the last, the last part here are the references. Okay, so it follows the general uh, parts of our research, which are justification, objectives, a state of the art, but this, the ones that you are seeing now, they are like general for a thesis. I very much like the ones of this case study because this is what you are going to do. You're going to go to a place, you will see something there and you have to make a proposal. You're not going to do a thesis, you're going to do a design proposal. And that index that you're seeing here, I think it's a very good one to follow. And I'm going to help you uh, with some hints about some parts and some general mistakes that you all do. Today I've been part of, a, as I was saying, part of, a, of the jury of some final dissertations and they were making some mistakes and now I'm going to keep on doing that and I will see probably the same mistakes again. So I'm going to tell you things you should avoid or you should do. Regarding the title, which is very important, is the first thing that you are going to see about something, the title. So it's crucial. It should have a maximum of 15 words. And look at the examples that you have here. The first two, they are wrong, but they are real. I mean, they are real. So is the application of handles get whoa, 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 whoa. So that many words, when you're finishing the title, you've forgotten what the title was about. And the second title is they, they. What the hell is they? Is they like aliens from a different planet? They is people from a, a different country. So it has no real meaning. So I'm going to give you two good examples uh, that follows, we, have, we call it the DPC standard, which is discipline, discipline, proposal, and case. You don't have to do exactly that, but if you don't have a better proposal, follow that rule with which you are going to make a good title. I'm giving you an example that I did. If I were part of that team, I would write a title like that, like interior design in Turkish ruins. This is the discipline. I'm going to do something about interior design in some ruins in Turkey. Second part, my proposal. We're designing the Isabey baths in Seljuk. And then I can talk about the case, or when we say case, it can be a more emotional title, like feeling the absence or being in love, or you can use a more creative title, but that's the last part. We have another good proposal about uh, graphic design, like design a visual communication for leisure activities, proposal of an escape room, uh, and then it was circus. Because this is a project that some students did here at the Sala. About the abstract, which is the last thing that you have to, but it's the first thing that anyone sees after the title, it has to include things from all the important sections. We don't save something for the rest of the article. Some people, they say, no, but I don't want to talk about my results or something very important in the abstract. I want, I want them to wait until the end. No, abstract has to say, we're going to do this. We did this methodology. These are the things that we have achieved. And this is the future lines. 
It has to be in a paragraph format, no citation in the abstract, no at all. And the length, the normal length is from 200 to 300. I have seen some, ab some abstract very short with 100 words and they were okay. And for a thesis and for a big academic work, it would be like 500. So I, I think that for you, 200, 250 should be okay. The justification, the first thing that you have when you are writing something to explain something that you've done is why you are doing it. And in this case, considering it's a design work, you should tell why the place is important. Is it a place that you in the middle of nowhere and no one cares about it? Is it an important place? Is it part of a bigger area? So you have to justify why you're working there. And you cannot answer because maybe some of you are thinking right now, well, the justification is because Sergio chose that place. I don't know. <laughs> Someone told me to go there and to do that job. Well, no, this, this cannot be the answer for this part. You have to tell what I'm telling you. You have to say, what's the purpose uh, of the research? And what's the interesting thing about that place? You have to say, which are the objectives? I give you an example. If I were the one uh, doing that job, I would say one of the objectives is to create a temporary space for meditation. Which are some of the mistakes we make when we're talking about objectives is remember three things about writing objectives. With three, four objectives, it, it, it might be enough for a work that we're going to do in a month time. So two, three, four maximum objectives, but they have to be feasible. So we cannot say as an objective, and this is something that we see very frequently, my objective is to make all the Turkish uh, archaeological sites very well known in the world. Sorry, no, no, no. This, is, this cannot be your, your objective. You're going to be in Turkey one week. You are coming to some sessions with me, Maria Jose, Sergio, um, and Angelo. So your objective cannot be that ambitious. But an objective um, has to be a specific of the specialty. We cannot say we want to bring health to, to Turkey. No, 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 that cannot be your objective. You're talking about interior design. And the third uh, piece of advice is it has to bring something positive to society. And with that, I mean, one objective cannot be, I want my mom to be proud of me. Sorry. Well, that's a very good thing because we love our moms. I do love my mom. But this cannot be an objective of an academic work. So it can be, I am going to increase the attractiveness of this area for tourism. That can be an objective. You can, if you have any questions or you can open your microphones and, or you can write your questions uh, for the end. The state of the art uh, is a brief completion of the knowledge about something. So what I showed you with the references, this is the state of the art. But the state of the art is not only to give seven references, it's to read them, to analyze them, and to write. It can be maybe one A4 or two A4s. So it doesn't have to be something very, very extensive. But to give some paragraphs explaining what can you find and what were the results of that references. So it's yes to read their references and to extract the most important parts and write them in your own words. That's the state of the art. The methodology I would follow, the, um, the one that I said in the case study, but when we talk about methodology, we have to, um, to do some drawings and methodology about interior design is methodology is to think about the target client who is going to use your design. Is it going to be only locals? 
Is it going to be only people invited from a place? Is it going to be, I don't know, in, in this school? Is, this school is used by students and teachers. Do we have very, very old people here? No. Do we have very, very, very young people here? No. It can be one day can come someone. I remember we had a student and she had a baby. So she brought the baby with her every day. So, but this is not the target client. This is someone, something that can happen from time to time. Our target client, they are people from 18 till 65 and they have a high culture level. So you have to do that uh, when you are explaining your methodology. What is going to be the use of, the, of your design? And the proposal of use, the materials and the 3D final images, some people put them in the results um, part of the document and some of the people, they put it in the methodology. Both, for me, they are okay. The results of your job is going to be drawings. It, it can be a plan. It can be a 3D, that 3D and the, and the drawing in the middle, they are from my thesis. And they were part of my academic work to do drawings and to do 3Ds. But apart from that, you have to do some written things. So images, only images are not enough. Continuing with the example of my uh, doctoral thesis, apart from drawings, sketches, 3D images, I had to explain the meaning of that images, the methodology, the process. And once you've done all the research, the state of the art, you've uh, explained your methodology, then you have to give some results. Your results will be drawings, 3Ds, and sketches, and a mood board. That will be part of your results. But apart from that, you have to do a discussion. What, is, what are you going to include in your discussion? You are going to tell us, or you are going to tell the the one who is reading your, your, your paper, you're going to tell them if your objectives were achieved or not. Maybe objective one was achieved, but maybe objective three, you could not do it for some reason, and you have to explain why you didn't achieve it. You have to point out any anomalies. Maybe you thought that you, it, it was going to be easy to take photographs, and for some reason, it wasn't. And you can speculate. You can think, I guess that these baths were only for rich people for some reason, and we want to use that. And you can speculate in the discussion. And this, I'm, in, this in the next slides, I'm going to go a little bit um, faster because they can be very boring. And I'm going to give the PDF to Sergio and he will share it with you. And this is a, a little bit more technical, but you should consider it. Uh, if you are going to make quotations, and a quotation is when you are writing in your work, but you are using information that, some, that, that someone else did. You've read a paper and you think some text on some ideas, they are interesting and you're going to use them. You cannot write them as if they were your own. This is wrong and this is even illegal. If you are using somebody else's knowledge, you have to quotate them. So you have textual quotations when you are writing and you copy and paste the exact words. Here you have an example of how to, use, how to do it. Like for example, when analyzing the results and according to Machado is the surname, in brackets is the years, and then in quotation marks, you put the text with copy and paste. But sometimes we don't copy and paste, we just use that information with our own words. In that case, this is a paraphrasis or indirect quotes, and you write the ideas in your own words, and at the end, in brackets, you put surname, comma, and the year. This is, I know this is a little bit more technical about writing a document. And I know it must be 
very boring and you must be looking forward to hear Maria Jose, who is going to present very beautiful and very interesting examples. But I'm going just to go faster in this area. You have to consider that you are going to produce a document. If they are good enough, we will try to publish them and we will try to share the knowledge. Uh, and one of the things about Erasmus is that they want to make the biggest impact that we can. So they want us to show everyone what you've done. So you have to do a good document apart from good drawings. So if there are more than 40 words in the copy and paste, you have to use the tab key and to make a different paragraph, okay? If you are using images, and this is very important, please pay attention because you are designers and you use images all the time. You have to reference them. You have to put uh, under the image, figure number, you have to number all the images. You have to put a title of the image. What am I seeing here? Even if it's always for you, even if it's something very clear and you think it doesn't need any explanation, you have to write as if you were writing for dumb people, let's say, no? Because you don't know who is going to read it. It's not going to be me or my Jose or Sergio, maybe someone from a different university, someone whose English is not very good, so you have to explain everything. So this is from my final thesis, figure 70, Union of cur Curved Rafters or Camones, surname and year. You have to cite the images as well if it's not yours. If it's your image, your 3D, you don't have to, you just have to put the title and figure number. And the last part is the bibliography, where you put all the things that you've looked. And please, if you are writing, if in your paragraph you are citing seven documents, the seven documents have, they have to be in the bibliography. And in, if, on the contrary, if in the bibliography you have 10 references, that 10 references, they have to be in the text. You, you cannot put anything in the bibliography that is not in the text or the same in reverse. I don't know. Is that clear, Maria Jose? I'm seeing your face in my computer. Yeah, I'm here. But do you think it's clear what I said about the bibliography? Yeah, I think so. I think so. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully, yes. And the last part of my presentation is going to be common mistakes in writing. Keep it short, keep it short. You don't want to bore anyone. So it, it doesn't matter if we copy and paste text from other people, but we have to keep it short. Be clear. I just added some dots about how to be clear. You can read them at home, but try not to make very long sentences. At least in Spanish, we tend in our language to use link sentences that are like five lines long. Sentences that you forget what you were talking about in the first place. And this is the way that some high culture people write, but this is wrong regarding academic works. This is wrong. It has to be clear, try to make short sentences, Try to avoid things that are not very clear, like um, at this moment you can put nowadays with one word, you can say the same. So use one word, okay? Capitalize letters. Here you have in English what you capitalize on what you don't. Have a look when you have the PDF. I'm not going to read that to you right now. You can do that at home. Very important, and this is a very, very common mistake about abbreviations and acronyms. That's why you have these two pictures. If you are going to say, if you're talking about health, about your body or something, and you say DNA, everyone in the world, everyone is going to understand what you're saying. So you don't have to explain because DNA, and if, if you're talking about health or cells or whatever that is related to your body, everyone is going to understand. But 
in spanish there is an there is something called uh, cm uh, cnmv maria jose do you know what cnmv is no i don't know <laughs> <laughs> is the uh, camera nacional del mercado de valores so it's a it's like a big institution that deals about the markets people trading with companies so something no one knows about so if you are going to talk about that organ that uh, organism that public body you have to explain the first time what this letter means from that onwards you can use that acronym but the first time that you use it you have to explain because it's not general knowledge when we write we have to bear in mind objectivity and formality we should avoid it doesn't mean that it's banned it's not banned but we should avoid i you better use um instead of saying i did or i found something it's better to use that like um the the information about the site shows that that site was established in the fifth century instead of i did that i am the protagonist you are not the protagonist the protagonist is the area is the bath that's the protagonist so please we can use passive verbs or we can use it no it can be demonstrated that the climate change is a real phenomenon or whatever and when we are writing a, a formal document we don't use con, uh, contractions please don't use contractions and we don't use colloquialism like for example it's like this is like it means nothing and this is something that all young people do all the time oh my god this is like and it with no meaning and it happens in, in all languages so please don't use it some other very common mistakes is uh, when the title is incomplete there are too many or there are no keywords um, the objectives are not in the infinitive an objective has to start with a verb in infinitive or there are some data or images without the caption, without the title. And I think this is my last uh, slide. Some other um, mistakes is that there is no mention, no mention about the methodology that you follow, um, or the conclusions are only expressing personal emotions. The conclusion of an academic work cannot be I am very happy. I'm going to show my friends uh, my work and I'm going to have a beer. This is not a conclusion. This is the last thing that you do after finishing it. <laughs> but this is not the conclusion of your academic job. And the bibliography, I would recommend the APA standard. There are some others, but probably for design, um, APA is the most common standard. So. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, this second part is more visual than the other one. So <laughs> um, we'll show some relevant examples of intervention in historic buildings through different strategies and different materials. Uh, the intervention strategies that we are going to see today are not only example of a strategy for rings, but the idea of each one can be extrapolated to intervene in them. Um, well, as you know, the choice of a strategy for an intervention in historic buildings depends on several factors. One could be the historical and constructive heritage value of the building. The second one could be the cultural heritage value and belonging to the context and the people. Sorry, Sir, Maria, Maria Jose, yes. I, I, I need to, I, I, I don't know if you are um, um, changing the slides because I, I don't think it is changing the slide. No, 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 not yet. Ah, okay, not okay. Yet. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry for interrupting. Not you. yet, not yet. Sorry, sorry. Um, the third, uh, the third uh, factor could be the strategy allowed by regulation. 
for the new use to be implemented and the temporality. Five, the designer sensitivity to intervene in heritage and other factors. So after this seminar, you could have multiple strategies to use, but it will depend on the project. Now yet, <laughs> as a summary, we have these five strategies, occupy and consolidate, complete and add, subtract and communicate, cover and tattoo, and insert and place. So let's see the first one. The first strategy consists in occupy or recycle a building to carry out activities for the new use. And for that, the intervention is minimum in the current state of the building. We have indication of this type of strategy for a long time ago. For example, the Basilica of Macentium is a Roman building from the fourth century. And after the decline, the Basilica was used for the Greco-Roman fights in Olympic games in 1960. Another example of occupation happened in art in the 60 communities of artists look for ways to give social meaning to their works. And the meetings of these artists were in abandoned buildings as a symbol of protest to art, like any this concept. Here, Andy Warhol, for example, was one of those artists who set up his studio on an existing building where he would produce most of his works. Well, the first project that I want to show now is the Matadero Square. And it's an intervention in the cattle market of Madrid. This market is a complex of 48 buildings dedicated to carrying out functions relating to cattle market during the 20th century. On 2005, new actions began to convert the complex into an artistic center. One of the first intervention strategies for the new use of the space was to reuse the square. And the intervention got the communication between the neighborhood and local visitor and the space. And this was achieved through pergolas, which serve like a main meeting point with any other intervention only occupying the square. Uh, this second project is called Intermedia y Matadero. And, um, by Arturo Franco in Madrid and is transformed into an exhibition center. The project preserves the historical values of the existing building with a minimal intervention. The old and the new languages show themselves like naked languages. And for that, the designer keeps the cuts producing the wall, like here, and the ceiling appears without complices. Also use materials coming from industrialization, for example, this table, like a large beam to get linked the old and new materials. And this is how it works now. Other example is the Fabrica Vicili by Moa Studio in Georgia. Um, before the rehabilitation of the place, the building was abandoned for a long time with no use to the neighborhood and society. Also, the district was unpopular for travelers or locals. So the starting point was to analyze the urban context where the project could bring multiple benefits for the area. And the proposal was to transform the empty building into an urban space that becomes a platform for artists to create and share their projects. The architects wanted to keep the spirit of the place by leaving naked walls, floors, paints and reused material from the site and decoration where possible. This is other project. Uh, it's called the House Road Ellenberg. It's a house located in Belgium with a facade similar to those of the neighborhood, but with a particular interior. This is a planimetry, it's a section. Everything keeps like it is, except for a single box inside the building. The life in this house takes place inside the box in an unfinished environment feeling. And through sliding doors, the structure is closed like a rectangular cube. 
The counterpoint to such a cold environment is provided by the fireplace in the center of a stage. And the large content and the wooden furniture create a feeling of home. Well, the second strategy is called complete and add and consists in adding a new shape or new form to complete the original current state of a building. This first project that I show is a project called Brick House over a Stone Bar by Bricolo Falsarella and Filippo Bricolo from Italy. And the project wanted to turn the annexes of the Villa Sacomini, is near from the city of Verona, and which were, which were used like a storehouse into a house. Before the project began, the annexes were seen like areas of low architectural value. This negative idea was because of a previous intervention with walls in concrete blocks on top of the original. And for this reason, the architect demolished the previous intervention and returned to the building the original form. Later, a new extension was built with bricks finished with a minimal visual intervention, preserving the aesthetic of the original state. This is images from the interior of the space. This is another one example. Uh, the archaeological site of Camp Ancoin in Spain suffered successive accumulation of soil for a long time. For the intervention like a viewpoint for the city, the solution was to work with the soil that covered the site. The gravel and rocks from the axial Roman quarry were selected and organized in a new position. The steel mess contains the new stones that reproduce the original position of the Roman walls, like you see in the following pictures. And thanks to this, we can see clearly the urban structure of the Roman village. The old church of Corbera di Ebre by Ferran Didoso in Spain had to restore the public use of the church in a new multifunctional space. And the challenge was not to change the appearance as a symbol of a battle Spanish civil war. So the solution for that was to close the ceiling with a transparent material. The result is to get this perception of the steel being outside when you enter into the church. And with this solution, this intervention, like a new public use of the church, helps the local people to reconcile themselves with their childhood playgrounds. The third strategy is called subtract and communicate and consists in dreaming the current state of a building to communicate spaces. The main artist of this type of intervention is Gordon Mata Clark. The relationship between private and public space became their subject matter. The interest in abandoned buildings has to work with to transform them. The conical intersect consists in opening a large hole on the walls of an apartment building that was to be demolished in a working class neighborhood in Paris. And the meaning of the work was to read an intention to show the idea of transparency in our architecture exhibiting the skeleton of the building. This is the process. Well, the next project is called Storefront Gallery by Stephen Hall and Vito Aconti in New York. And the project replaced an existing exterior facade with a series of 12 movable panels that pivot to open the tile lengths of the gallery directly onto the street. It blurs the limit between interior and exterior and enables possibility of panel configuration that encourage artists and visitors to create their own experience of entry into the gallery space. Another example is Hoop Flat, whose flag is an apartment transformed into a contemporary studio and living place by Chortichaga Studio, is here in Madrid. 
Um, the strategy is inspired by the work of Gordon Mata Clark and used subtraction as a strategy to transform the space. Without losing the historical characteristic of the flat, they carved the walls and doors with holes, allowing communication between the spaces. The eye is an instrument with, that you can reread and you can play to. It is possible to wonder if this is a hole or this is a mirror creating an unexpected appearance in the space. Next sample is the Mills Museum by Flores and Prats in Mallorca. It's here in Spain as well. The old mill is turned into an exhibition center to show the history of the mills and the solution to create a path for the exhibition and how the object could be illuminated was to work with the existing holes, windows and doors and to explore how to shape these different entrance of light. The result is a light path that marks the reading of the new museum, which doesn't have division in the space. And to control the entrance of light from the bright exterior to the interior, a series of chambers like that modify the existing holes so the light is trapped in these exhibiting volumes. The fourth strategy is cover and tattoo and consists in adding a second scheme to cover the current state of the building. And here, for example, we have an example in the Matisse studio and how he used the walls like canvases. Other examples are the bar galleries full of pictures, painting and covering the walls. And also during the 19th century, wallpaper was used like a wall covering instead of painting. Here is this, the first uh, project of this strategy and it's called the Reichstag. The artists of the Reichstag, Christo and his wife, Jean-Claude, are known for covering large monuments with textile materials to stimulate people's curiosity and thoughts. This historic building fascinated Christo like a symbol of freedom. And for these reasons, two years after the German reunification in 1989, Christo and Jean-Claude covered the German parliament in a similar way to unconvert it later, like a symbol of transformation of history and freedom. Another artwork of this artist was the Palazzo Bricherasio in Italy, uh, where Christo performed the gallery space like a white cube. In this case, the public not only contemplated the art, but also could participate in it. So, as the visitor walked, it was transformed into a surface of ways that suggested a living and changing landscape. The transformation was minimal, but it was more than enough to change the look and feel of the space, creating an atmosphere of silence and tranquility. Other example is the studio Panic Production and they, they are a duo of artists who create ephemeral inflatable installation. For this project, the place chosen by the artist uh, was the interior patio of the Parque Lage School of Visual Arts in Barcelona with an orange inflatable cube that covered the historical patio and the pool. The proposal is open without any interest in defining what is said or what it means. Its proposal is different like its visitor. So what we see first is a balloon, an artistic object expanded. And this expansion is related to the architecture of the place and is identified. So the viewer enters the interior of the work and observes how the space previously known or not was reconfigured by this monochrome plastic layer creating this sensation. This is the process. This is all the, all the works of the same studio. It's called El Claustro in Mexico.
Okay, next sample is called uh, Cinema Matadero. And this cinema is another intervention in the complex of the Matadero by Churtichiaga Studio. In this case, the proposal was to introduce some basket into the current building with an illuminated skin. This skin is made up of frame of steel tube with industrial irrigation hoses and leads. And then a continuous carpet of pine painted in black covers the walls, floors, and ceiling, defining the new architecture of the spaces and avoiding always covering the original factory walls. The result is like two worlds, some illuminated basket against the dark single material wooden black background. This image is the, the same space without no light and lights. Oops. And the last strategy is called insert and place and consists in inserting a box or multiple boxes to contain the next program for the new use. Here we have an example by Antonello da Messina painting um, Saint Jerome in his studio where it shows an object like a large bulb inside a church. The well-known and popular fast wood house designed by the architect Mitz van der Rohe is composed for a single metallic structure closed with glass. Only a central box of wood contains the bathroom and creates the separation between the kitchen, two bedroom and the living room. This project is called Dove, Dove Cot Studio and is a music studio inside a ruin by Howard Tompkins in England. This is the current state of the Dove code before the intervention. The strategy used by the designer was to introduce a new structure inside the previous one, respecting the existing facade. Uh, this new structure is made in curtain steel and is understood like another structure but complement the existing container matching the color with the original red bricks. So the result is a building that from a distance evokes the ghost of the original structure, but seen from close to reveals itself like new. The construction was created by local steel workers and then brought to the site to be assembled. The final step was to introduce it with a crane. This is the interior space. Media Lab Prado um, yeah. is a rehabilitation of a sheet for an artistic center by Langarita Navarro Architects in Madrid. And for the reform, the architects decide not to touch the facade and concrete structure of the building and insert a more flexible structure inside made of removable and reusable elements that can be adapted to the future needs of the center. For example, the elements that compose it can be used like support for digital experimentation and partition walls are used like digital screens. And the last project is called, oh, sorry, the Mies de Gos Museum by Space Worker Studio. Uh, focuses on the creation of an exhibition structure inside an old church in Portugal. The proposal was to value the characteristic of the space and minimize the impact respecting the system building, moving away from the walls, trying to place in a central position, coping the geometry of the building originated by an offset of the shape of the ceiling and walls with a nucleus that receives an organized distribution and the visitors. Yeah, um, that's all. <laughs>